Hi, everybody. It's Kathleen with Creative Interviews, Two Sisters Creative Interviews. And today I am just so grateful to be with Evgenia Emmets. And we're going to be talking about her art. We're going to be talking about her project of Eternal Forest. Um, her and I have been talking and getting to understand more of this project for quite a while now, for months, I don't know, maybe even longer. And it's taken us a while to get to this place where we can actually have this interview, but I think it's perfect timing. I know that you'll all feel it in your soul too. And to begin with, I just want to uh, tell you a little bit more about Virginia. And first of all, just hello, Jenia. <laughs> it's so good to have you here, sweetheart. Thank you. Well, Evgenia was born in Boltava, in USSR, in 1979, and has lived in Moscow and London, and lives in Portugal since 2017. In 2008, Evgenia graduated with a master's in fine arts from Central St. Martin's College of Art. In 2010, she founded Anna Lima Group Arts Collective, which explores visual sound. Evgenia has been working on integrating poetry she has been writing since she was 14 into her art practice. She creates works on the intersection of sound and visual poetry through artist books, calligraphy, performance, objects, large-scale ecological art, and the Eternal Forest is an ongoing art project which marks a transition towards the integration of ecological thinking into her art. So I'd love to welcome you, um, Evgenia, to Creative Interviews with Tree Sisters. And the uh, first thing I would like to ask you is, what drew you to Tree Sisters? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, it's really good to be here with you, like always. <laughs> Good talking to you and good talking also to you in this context and sharing and sharing with everyone who is going to watch this. So my story of connecting with Three Sisters is probably from one year old. And I met somebody uh, who is also a Three Sister, Susie Steer and uh, she suggested when i met her she suggested well why don't you become a tree sister and i thought to myself wow this sounds really amazing what is it <laughs> i didn't know what the organization is how it works but i simply went online and i connected i registered and then I just started exploring and feeling into the space and seeing what is being shared, how the organization works, how it works from the point of view of community, how Three Sisters is creating community across the world. And I think I got very much inspired and um, yes, wanting to do more, wanting to understand more and to connect more. And then Yes, and then we started talking with yourself, Kathleen. And yeah, having these wonderful conversations online and which, which are endlessly inspiring for me. Well, thank you, Susie Steer, <laughs> our, <laughs> beloved, our beloved Susie, for um, bringing, yeah, for being, calling you in. And, you know, like you said, since you were a little girl that you've been called to the trees and to the forest. And I'm just, I'm just so like excited to share um, all of your journey and what, it, what you have created through your art. Um, we talked a little about, bit about how you've been connecting the sound and the poetry since you were very little. And I'd like you, if you could just explain a little bit more about that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so 
this for me the poetry is really the starting point it's really the beginning it's also something that i think beyond any kind of social norms and construct for me was always easier to connect with um i also grew up in culture in russian culture which is very very much based in poetry and literature and there is a lot of value in it and put in it when we grow up as children and so i learned by heart a lot of things growing up but then what happened is Mm, there was a moment in my life when my grandfather left this world and that was the day when I wrote my first poem and it was very unexpected. I did not understand quite what happened then. Um, but now looking back, I feel that something much bigger came through and I was just, I just had to kind of receive it and stay with it until now. And then as I was um, working a bit, trying to find my place in the art world and in the arts and exploring my creativity, I didn't quite, it didn't quite fit with me what I was trying to do with the photography. I did a lot of photography, some film, but really when things started clicking together and forming in a more, I would say holistic way and making more sense is when I realized that actually I can connect my poetry and my visual work through calligraphy, through calligraphic practice. And so I started um, quite a few years with Chinese, some Chinese teachers, some Chinese masters in London when I was living there. And I was very lucky because in such a big place you can actually find a good teacher. And then I also studied from Japanese teachers and I always wanted to do my own thing, not stay with kind of traditional calligraphy, but I I am endlessly, you know, grateful and owning everything that I have today and that I can do and I'm learning every day to those masters who came before me. So although I'm not really following in the tradition, I'm kind of absolutely part of it, if you see what I mean, in the more experimental way. And then the sound perspective comes in because I love working with the voice, I, I love doing performance, but also always try to understand how sound affects us and how human voice through sound can affect everything. So I studied sound therapy for quite a few years. And although I'm not doing sound therapy directly, I'm not practicing as a therapist, I'm kind of embedding all three aspects into my work since, yeah, and every, every project is different, but it's always there in some shape and form. It, it is, it's just so interesting. I could just, you know, listen to how you put this all together, you know, for hours and days. And I know that you and I have had many huge conversations. Um, before, I, before I continue, I just want to ask you, like, the, the lighting and, the, and how the sun is coming in is so gorgeous. And, and, and there's, like, a point of light that was hitting your third <laughs> eye, like, so perfectly. But if you could just skip, you know, kind of to the right a little bit, I think we start to see a little bit more of your gorgeous face. Let's see um, there you, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Even though I'm, I'm going to shine uh, you know, right in my face. <laughs> but, if, but if it's blinding to you, that's okay. You can lean to the other way, whatever is comfortable for you. But I'm just sort of letting you know that. Um, I sit like this. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's the bright, moving. The sun's going down right yeah, now, it's, right? It's going to go down in a minute. Yeah, it's, yes. it's, it's a super bright Portuguese light, but I, I think I'm very <laughs> happy to actually stay in the light. It's going to go down in a second behind the, behind the wall, behind the roof. I can, yeah. I can just about see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm not important right now anyway. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, it's, you know, it, it is amazing, really, um, when you think about, you know, taking something that you you learn from the masters and, and bringing it forth in, in an organic way. And I think that is truly, you know, what we're being called to do right now is to almost to create the new, new practices from the old practices, you know, because we are not them and the world is not as it was, um, but those are very, very valuable um, teachings that should be carried on, but also evolved. So I, that's how I feel that it is, um, 
a masterful way of bringing them into what you're doing. So you're, you're honoring, you know, the sacredness of the practice and you're listening for what's next and what's new um, that's coming and being really in tuned into uh, listening as I know that you are to the earth and to, um, you know, the sacredness all around us to see what is the next move that you should do and where are you guided into. So I truly, um, love that so much um, that it you know it inspires me just to think of that idea of bringing something that the masters had done in the ancient arts and um, it's uh, something that i do too is with the eco arts you know kind of the foraging for the pigments for the art for the materials to paint with and to go into the forest and dig and find those colors and listen to what 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 they were listening to but we're not doing we don't have you know we cannot do it the same as they did but we we can honor that 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 practice was created before us <laughs> but now that we're bringing it in a new way we're listening to what's going on now um, I love also the the sound healing practice work so I'm going to actually share the screen right now um, so you can relax back into the shadow if you like to <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that I have to, I'm going to make each picture that I show I'm going to be toggling up here in the top so everyone knows to make it a little larger but this is one of the most beautiful um, photographs first of all so this space um, tell me more about what was happening in this space and of course we could see that you're working with the um, the are they brass the brass they look gold but um, are they brass uh, singing bowls uh, yeah so this is uh, this is a photo from um, an exhibition we did in in Geneva in a place um, Gosh, I forgot the name of the place actually. So I, these are the bowls that I'm using a lot in my practice and I'm using now, these days, I'm using them for, or I'm involving them rather in inviting them into pretty much every new moon, full moon, or otherwise any kind of celebration. And they've been a lot inside the um, space, inside the buildings, but they recently started coming out a lot in nature. They love being in nature. And they love also experiencing the moonlight and the sunlight differently because, because they're handmade and they are all different. They are all, probably each of them have at least seven metals. This is the tradition. This is the Tibetan tradition. They are not all Tibetan. Some of them are from Nepal. Some of them are newer or older. Some of them are 50 to 100 years old. But because the way they're made, they're malleable. So the, the, the metal always changes with the temperature and depends on the conditions and i play them a lot um in this particular exhibition what happened is we had actually several rooms where the sound was traveling around the space and the whole the whole project was about time and the language and how language um really how the perception of language changes through time and how we use different types of languages to express different things as 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 beings and different kind of levels of existence or different dimensions of our being and so what you see is this really long scroll i think in total they didn't fit here the eight panels and it's a very long poem that's written along this line along the wave the, the project is called the wave the wave because of the sound is the wave but also because of this wave that kind of takes with it the language and how Mm -hmm. language is always shifting um mm -hmm. so i did a performance with my voice but also played and that poem was performed kind of in a more concrete way but also then going more into abstract form of the voice more like chanting and singing and people also were part of that performance so they could also participate directly and sing and chant and experience yeah. the space oh. and immersive sound yeah, I can only imagine what that would be like to be there live. I love um, singing bowls of all kinds and all metals. I love glass and, you know, just sound healing in general is, I, you know, I actually do it quite a lot. And I think it is uh, one of the most 
um, healing, you know, deepest healing practices that we can do. I love how you take the symbology, though, and move it into the artwork as, as you create the experience. I, I'm hoping that you have a recording of that that we can share with everyone later um, of you singing, do you using your voice and um, mm -hmm. we're going to be doing um, one of your poems in a few minutes here. Here's another one of your of your projects if you'd like to explain it to us. Uh, so this one is um, you see some basically pieces of paper from the book from the cutouts from the book hanging it was a bigger uh, exhibition that is called time wave so since a few years I'm exploring the perception of time in our cultures in our culture and actually multiple perceptions and how that perception of time can shift our everyday reality and how it affects our everything that we do and basically how we construct uh, life um, how we create things how can we how we collaborate with each other and that particular image is I found the book um, uh, which talks about time, but I think it's from the 19th century. It's a really small book. And I cut out pieces. Uh, each chapter I sent to, um, I think, 13 or 14 different people. And then I asked them to respond to a question that relates to time. For example, what is the form of time? Mm -hmm. Or how does the time move? Is the time dynamic or static? I don't remember all the questions. And then they they sent me back their responses and the responses are on this transparent paper mm -hmm. against the original chapters. So, mm -hmm. and now I have it as a, as a book, which is completely different from the original book that I have. So if we put it all together, yeah. it's like a thing that you could put on a table or it could be a publication. So mm, it was yeah. the project with the project. Yeah, I love how you're delving into language and time, you know, sort of the, the origins of who we are, you know, what, how we base our, our lives on and our livelihoods. And, you know, I also love that, that you reach out um, to listen to what others have to say and how they're going to respond and make that, bring that in as part of your art. It's, um, it's a stunning way to uh, bring art alive for everyone. Here are some of your, your stones. I love working with people. I love really, basically I consider that audience is not the audience. Audience are all participants. Mm -hmm. So for me in my work, most of all, I consider everybody who enters the space, they're all participating. So this was, um, the basis for an artwork we did in a church in London and it was a part of the Baltic art festival so it was basically focused around Baltic culture uh, of the Baltic region and I did uh, compose a poem um, around the female and male line and the words that are related the, the key words that are related to these two lines in five different languages, including English, Russian, Estonian, Latvian, and Lithuanian. And we performed it. So there was a choir that performed it based on the key roots that connect between the languages. Mm. And the people were responding with another microphone. So it was really a collaborative process and people would have to bring one of these rocks to us, to the performers, and then we would respond and they would have to respond back. So it was a totally, I would actually really love to stage it once again, because, because it was done only once. So. Yeah, yeah, it that seems like it would be. It's hard to repeat. You need to kind of almost yeah. bring this whole setting situation together to be able to resurrect it, you know, it's, but it's lying waiting maybe for its time. Yes, absolutely. I think that, you know, it, it, it sounds like a conversation that we're really involved in now more than ever. I know that in Tree Sisters, you know, we're talking a lot about translation and language and the, the words that, that we use as Tree Sisters culture and how are they interpreted by other languages. And it's really varied, you know, it's like all... It's so different. And then there's words in certain languages that mean things that, you know, we want 
to be able to try to say, but that word is already created in, in another language. It's so interesting. I'm sure you come across a lot of that. Now, are you able, are you versed in, in um, those six languages or, or seven languages? No. So I speak, I would only be able to speak English and Russian, but the thing is that I was specifically looking for the roots between the languages because um, Russian has relationship with Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit and Lithuanian and Latvian and Estonian is like a completely different family, which I only discovered when I actually did the project. It is Finno-Goric family. So no, I don't speak these languages, but um, I'm always fascinated to go beyond the language and look into the root and what's there what's the deeper meaning and what's the matrix of the word that we can actually connect with on a completely different level without necessarily connecting words into the sentence as we do now. Yes. So I'm very interested in how word exists almost as a poem in its own right or as a meaning in its own right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally understand that. As, kind of a as... freestanding tree, you know, like yeah. <laughs> the forest and then you have a freestanding tree, which. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, each word has carried this energy forward. I know there's some studies that they've measured the, the sound waves when a certain word is spoken. And um, I don't remember exactly who it was that um, did the, the study, but that the word peace had the highest vibration. I would have thought that it was love, but um, the spoken word peace has the highest vibration on the scale of vibration when it's spoken, which is, is different than looking at the root of it, but also interesting. interesting yeah. uh, I'm going to um, move on to this next one. And they're doing some gardening outside my house right now, next door neighbors. So, um, <laughs> sorry. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> so this one is um yeah it's a very long scroll it's a vertical scroll so i sometimes do horizontal or vertical super long scrolls one of them i've done recently is 22 meters i think we'll see it later this is one of the earliest i've done and it's called interrogated silence so interrogated silence is actually a practice i did myself when I felt something needs to emerge and come out from the deeper sense of my being. And it was more like a ritual which I did where I would be calling and inviting things to come to the surface from the unconscious mind, from the depths. And by, by, by letting them come out, I would also let go of things. And then I imagined that perhaps I could make um, that space available for other people. So that was that installation was done in a crypt. It's a real crypt of St. Pancras Church in London. And it's a really, really special place. I was there in a um, kind of retreat for 10 days every day. It's a very, very intense space because it's a real crypt with a lot of bodies still there. But it was a very, very beautiful experience. And what I did is I put this scroll on the floor and I invited people. You don't see another piece of paper with ink uh, and uh, brush. And I allowed people to sit in meditation, in, in contemplation, and also come up, let, let something to come up and write it on the piece of paper and basically let go of it. Nice. And so I also have the recording of this poem, which is... Basically, you listen it at the beginning before you do the practice. So yes. it's not really a poem. It's more like a part of the practice, like invocation. Yes, yes. an invocation. It, this, this feels, I mean, I can't, you know, I can't fully imagine what it would be like to be there in the crypt with the, the bodies that are there. But the sacredness is comes through in this photograph. You're very... Um, of course, very talented at taking the photographs too, but to lay out this in this way is just calling you in. And, you know, I, I would see, you know, that I would love to be there and to be able to just to come in into such silence and, you know, be listening to what needs to come forward. It's, I can't wait also to listen to that recording and share it with everyone. 
Incredible. So now we're going to go into like, so those are sort of the basis of, of your work, the, the, um, the roots maybe of um, what moved you into what we're going to talk about next, which is the manifesto and, you know, the eternal forest. And this is um, the, the even deeper connection with, with tree sisters and what our mission is and the connection that we have to to earth and to trees, um, bringing the language and the listening and the sound into the expression of what what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Kathleen, for for um, for this um, yes for this introduction to the yes. I think I think it's interesting how. What I wanted to reflect on before going into talking about eternal forest is I'm, I'm really fascinated how you personally chose the images and how you connected to everything without kind of me saying, oh, it should be like that or like this. You really uh, got it. You really connected all the dots in this really beautiful line, in this really beautiful story and narrative. Um, which sometimes I'm not aware that, you know, it's immediately re readable because I have so much work done and it's all there, but it's, it's such a, such a labyrinth, such a labyrinth of meanings and approaches. Yeah. So I'm really grateful how you, how you, how you uh, build it up. Thank you. Thank so you. It, it's, you know, it, it's, it's truly, I mean, you already know, but I already, I feel, I feel it. Um, speaking to me since the day that you and I first started talking and it, it is speaking in this labyrinth like you know um, which is alive with with like uh, possibility and um, you know that it, it it came fully together you know as we were talking just before we actually started recording when I showed you you know what I kind of pulled together and but I wanted to you know get the timeline right and so you know it, it, it came together the way that it's supposed to come together you know I get I get um, really emotional about these type of things because to me this is um, this is the direction that we, we need to be going is to be allow for the organic, allow for, you know, the not knowing and the mystery along with tracking it, you know, and looking back to the origins and the masters and, you know, the ancestors and, um, you know, listening for what's next and you know this is something that i think you do so beautifully and so i tune into that right away and um i'm just yeah i'm just carried by it which is what i feel um a lot of people who are attracted to what you're doing that they're carried by that energy that's constantly listening and moving forward and not having to know what mm -hmm. the absolute end result is so um you know that trusting. being trusting, trusting. And, tr and, gra and gratitude you know and yes. you know and those two actual um i say their words like we're talking about words now trust and gratitude but the those two ways are ways of being you know to me personally like those are the two uh, ways of being that rescued me when I needed to be, they called me forward when I need to be, those two words, it's always those two words that I drop back into and I say, okay, you know, when things just get to feel like what's next or, or how could we survive in a way certain things and, you know, um, that's happening right now in the world and been happening ongoing, but now they're really all coming to the, to the thing, is trusting, you know that we, if if the, the universe and um, Earth and the big mystery, the big divine, the big universal energy that um, we're all connected to has a plan, and we, you know, there is a, a natural 
thing happening here and just to keep listening to it and trusting that as we listen, we'll be guided. And, you know, that I know there's a lot of, of us. <laughs> That's what makes me happy now that there's more of us listening and um, really tuning into that. And then I'm so grateful <laughs> for that. And um, anyway, I can talk about that a long time, but we want to hear more about um, Eternal Forest. Uh, so I moved on to this next picture of Eternal Forest. Actually, this picture is the perfect one to start with. And thank you so much for choosing this one. So I just want to say something uh, responding also to what you um, were talking about is that the trusting, not, not knowing, but going with it and staying and listening deeply. So um, this is how Eternal Forest started, in fact, because I moved from London, from the center of everything, how many people imagine, a big, big city. Mm, and I was very happy there. I was very happy there for 10 years. And we moved um, for some reasons because we also wanted to not be in a big city anymore uh, together with my husband. But what happened is as we were moving to Portugal, which was the chosen place of life for us three years ago, I had a lot of anxiety, I would say, and worries and uncertainty about what I'm going to do as an artist because Portugal is not exactly is not exactly as being in a place like London for the arts and for an artist. Uh, plus, we are not really in Lisbon. We are living outside of Lisbon and there's not so much happening here in the arts at all. There is nothing. But so, so I, was, I, was, I was sitting with that and I was transitioning, but I think something really magical happened in that moment. And I like, I like to be with that feeling and that state of being that I just, I just endlessly trust universe. And I know that in the right moment, the right things and the right people and the right um, events will happen. So what happened was quite spectacular. It was the time of the fires. It was the year of the most, some of the most devastating fires in Portugal. And we were, it was a synchronicity because we came directly into the meeting, reforestation meeting, grassroots initiatives here in Portugal for completely different reasons. We went there because we wanted to connect with people who want to create communities. But what happened is we walked into the room and the whole three days was about forest fires and forest and deforestation and loss of biodiversity. I mean, the whole space just opened up. And so I just realized, of course, not immediately, but uh, gradually I realized that as an artist, I actually probably can just try to do something because just the sheer amount of the, the energy and the suffering that was in that room really pushed me, really gave me this kind of, it was like a negative impulse, but it turned out to be actually quite positive. And so the image that you see here was the first art, art residency I did, which is in the place that six months after the forest fires, I went there. So everything around that area, kilometers and kilometers was black, was still burnt and you could still see all these traces. This is a little corner of real forest that I found by the small stream. And the reason why it was there is because it was an abandoned agricultural land. And at that moment, what I did in 2018, I made a film, I did a series of interviews, a series of artwork, poetry. But I think the most important thing was that particular place, that particular photo that you chose, because the place is a sanctuary. And it is not necessarily, I don't need yet to, 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 to do, go and do something there because it is already there and it's not going anywhere. It stays already, it's part of the project. But even after I made all the work and I went back home, that place only after one year revealed that it is a sanctuary. So 
I believe now that the initiation for the project really came from that particular place. And this is, it's very hard to put it into words because it's totally magical. Yes. Oh my goodness. Well, now I understand what you mean when I chose these pictures and there was, there was a, a lot, you know, to choose from, from, you know, your bodies of work, but I just sort of instinctively you know, I listen in that way too. And I was like, well, this one, it just spoke to me. I'm like, okay, you want to come with? Okay. And, and now I didn't even know this story um, around this picture, this space, this spot, um, what happened that day for you and how this is a, you know, even that this is a, a sanctuary. Um, wow. I'm, I'm kind of um, speechless in this moment that, and, and I, I want to really just go to, go to this place and do some listening of my own. Um, <laughs> I have to make them smaller so I can get to the next one, um, just in case anybody's wondering. I'm going to move this now. So I'm going to move into uh, the manifesto. Um, great thank yes. you thank you for bringing this up so this is this is something that actually already happened last year so this is a newer work so i'm just going to give you a little bit of an arch here because the the eternal forest really started with that idea of big question why humans are doing what they're doing what's the motivation and why are we actually destroying everything that's around us? Why are we destroying the actual place that feeds us, that gives us air, that gives us water? We are planting, in some cases, the monocultures right next to our door, and then our houses burn and we lose lives. So it's like, I just couldn't put one, to, one and one didn't make sense and they couldn't understand. And so that, that, that made me make that film that uh, we're gonna also see, I think, the picture later. And I think through that film and through conversations with people, I gradually arrived to the point when um, I started questioning the motivation from the perspective of a productive and extractive relationship with nature. And a lot of people were asking me, well, if you don't want to plant monocultures, what is it that you want to do? What is your solution? And then that's how, that was the start of Eternal Forest Sanctuary kind of stage, stage and step of the project because I dropped into the space of, I don't want to deal with the whole ecosystem services idea. I just decided it's for other people I can actually put it away and I can go into a different direction. It was a very conscious choice. And I decided I would like to go and experience um, more what I call spiritual sacred connection with nature and really understand how deep is it, where it runs, uh, how can we really restore that connection and how can we... Um, tune ourselves in order that that connection just comes through simply so the manifesto that you are now showing on the screen is really um, a very very long poetry piece it's a 10 minute piece it also came through without me planning so much i was just in my studio last summer after another art residency which i did last year and that was just available i was there for about one and a half months just listening in and trying to be present and just deeply listening and the whole manifesto came through day by day so it was kind of dictated by eternal forest and so then it became a central the core the core work that connects everything else. It connects the experiences, it connects performance work, it connects all the visual work, it connects artist books, it connects future projects, it connects physical space of eternal forest sanctuary. So, and it's also meant, going back to the language, it's also meant to be translated in any language where we will create one of 1000 eternal forest sanctuaries. Right now it's in English, of course, it's in Portuguese because I did already some work here, but it, 
for example, it's been just translated into French and I've got no idea why France is calling me already since one year. I've got no idea how it's going to happen, but it's been just translated and it will be published in, I think, August. So I'm just being there, trusting and seeing, you know, what else is there to <laughs> And that little, yeah. that little scroll that you see now, I have it here as well in my studio. Oh, yes. Let me toggle back to that. And um, yeah, it's right here. It's folded like this. So I, it's a, I, ho I call it hard scroll because there is another one that is really big that I cannot take with me to the forest. And I put it in my pocket or in my bag. And when I go to the forest with people, I unfold the whole thing and then I read it. But I don't read it. Um, it's not really like a performance. It's really more like anybody who is present I'm hoping that they will connect to eternal forest. They will be initiated. Mm. So it's more like a magical initiation scroll. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I'm, kind of, I'm trying to get into my share screen again. All right. Back. <laughs> it's a, definitely a magical invocation. And, you know, it's, it's just so beautiful how you've been really stunning, how you've woven all of these things that we talked about together. Um, each, each one is, um, comes together in this for the care of the forest, you know, it, and it's an, it's an ongoing art project, but you know, that, uh, when, when people talk about art projects, they sometimes think that it has to be this and only this, or, you know, it has to be a, a painting, or it has to be the clever cookie or the sound, or, but, you know, then to connect it with uh, your vision to create a thousand eternal forest sanctuaries, um, inspired by that little place that you know outside of that retreat that you're in all across the world and to also to protect them for a thousand years yes. um it, you know to uh, to up the game of how up long the up the game for how long we we think we can protect you know certain things so i know you and i have been talking a lot about that like what what are the rules around that what makes it possible to uh protect for us to actually you know um bring that into our laws so that we we know and then do some type of global uh protection of the land and i know that you know we're we're, we're thinking about what that might look like for tree sisters tree projects and we're thinking about like in our you know all the tree sisters are kind of scattered all over the world which you know um when you and i had talked i thought oh you know we've got all these beautiful tree sisters and tree brothers in different places and maybe they can you know sort of research in different areas um what areas are protected what forests are protected and made sanctuaries where they live and and try to you know find the common denominator that we can bring together globally which is kind of unfolding in it, in its own way um and then you have this film that we talked about uh, for a few minutes in the beginning maybe you could talk about it a little more because we're going to be doing a screening um, for Tree Sisters of this film with you. Uh, we don't have a date set yet, but that's in the works. And so if you could just talk a little bit about this, this film, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I actually never made a film uh, before, before it's an old forest film. It wasn't something that I was really into. It's not really my method so much. And when I did that first art residency, um, I realized that probably there are many different ways to send a message to the people, to the world, what I find, what finds me, um, what needs to come out. And somehow I had a vision that there needs to be a film. There needs to be a series of interviews, give, give voice to the people who live either in the forest, next to the forest, next to monocultures, and I brought together people from different villages of very different ages, international uh, foreigners and also Portuguese people. And I just asked them same set of questions. And so in the film, you don't see the forest and a lot of people ask me why there is no forest. Well, because the forest is invisible, it doesn't exist, especially here where we did the film. It's really 
small pockets of biodiversity and real forest. Um, so people talk about their relationship with forest in many different ways. It comes through on many different levels. Um, and of course, they talk about monocultures and fires because this is something very present. But there is, there is somehow, and I didn't know what's going to come through in terms of whether there will be hope or whether the situation would be drastic, completely hopeless. But there is hope in the film. There is hope. It's quite, I think it's quite apparent. Yes. And, and what happened when I did the film? So I started screening it and more people started saying, oh, why don't you go and screen it in this community, this association, this museum, this library? And so I did maybe in total over 50 screenings all around Portugal and some in the UK. And it just rolled on and on. There was some effort in this, of course, to organize, but it allowed me to connect to the audience as if they were part of the film. Because of course, after each screening, you have a discussion. And then during this discussion, things come through that I would never, um, I would have never connected to if I didn't do this physical screening. So, um, Right now, I mean, I only did one online screening in total. The rest were physical audience, whether it's 10 yeah. or 50 people or, yeah, so anything between. And it was really great experience for me. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it just, it also, the set thread and the way that you're weaving, you know, the audience participation into it is, you know, getting everybody involved is, and, and asking again for their input. And, but you're posing the questions and you're, and also just making the film having never made a film, um, you know, it, it just really takes a lot of guts, but it, it also takes a, that trust. I think that we were talking about like this, you're listening, you heard, this is what, what you, what is being called to do is to actually go in. And I love this film so much because, you know, you just hear everybody uh, how much they love the forest or miss the forest or how they're connected to the forest. And it was such an important thing, but you dropped into it. You said, okay, I trust this is what needs to be done right now. And um, I love, I love how these steps are like organically unfolding and um, it's radical, really. It's very radical just to, Okay, I'll try something. I'll listen and I'll go for this and I'll try this. Um, it's just really wonderful. And I wanted to just take a step back for a minute. And when I was talking about the, the laws of protecting the forest and protecting earth in general, we have been... Um, you know, I talked to Stop Ecoside, Polly Higgins Legacy, and the they have uh, attorneys there that are working with environmental law and um, upholding Ecoside. And I mentioned, you know, what you're doing. And so we have some some lawyers that are already discussing to be brought into this and just naturally everything will come in to support what is needed to come through us. So like, as you're listening, your listening is being automatically supported by the universe. And I think that's what I'm really drawn to mainly. Um, just besides, I just love you as a, as a, as a sister and a friend. It's, um, it's so beautiful. So the next thing that, I mean, we could talk forever. So I'm just trying to move, move things, uh, keep this. Um, but here is, uh, we're going to, have you read and um, one of your poems and that we can all sort of sink into it and you know I want everyone to see this um, but also you know maybe half half mass your eyes relax your eyes and and just be when um, Evgenia is reading this poem to to really just listen uh, and be in in your listening space and your in your silent space um, while we're doing that. But if you want to explain a little bit before you read the poem, that would be beautiful too. Thank you, thank you, Kathleen. So this is one uh, fragment out of, uh, I think, one, two, three, nine, I think nine artworks which form a panel. So the whole panel is a full poem, which I'm going to read now. And this one is the beginning of the poem. And um, 
but it, it can be as a separate artwork in its own right. And what happened is um, in winter, just before COVID, I started going to the forest almost every day and recording uh, poems that I wrote since beginning of Eternal Forest Project because I have them written, I have them published inside the book, self-published. I have them in a visual form and in sonic form, but I didn't have them. I just had this idea, I'm going to read them in the forest. So it really worked and I'm continuing to do that. Um, and I really loved that process because it also makes me embody the poetry. And so this poem actually is written as part of the cycle in 2018, which is right at the beginning um, of the project. So that is an arch that came from 2018 into present, into I would say May, when I decided that I would actually like to explore the color green. <laughs> of course, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I have been doing a lot of work with water. And if you track back uh, recent work and if you look attentively there is a lot of water lines invisible ones that make poetry become abstract so what happens here is i'm connecting the water and very different colors of water with this watercolor mixed by myself with different colors uh, of green different shades of green i'm very interested in how strata is forming grasses are growing how all these different shades of green are in the forest, but also exactly like you, Kathleen, just said, if you kind of visually listen in and relax your eyes, you might be seeing things there that, you know, that are coming uh, through, uh, but not in a very conscious way. They're coming through because they want to end up on paper. And a lot of this work is a uh, chance because the when i first make uh, lines of water in paper in this aquarelle paper and then i write with ink um, with uh, more dense aquarelle i don't actually know how things start flowing so there is a lot of flow movement in it there is all the words are there so what you see now on the screen is you see the first two lines which says cut off an edge of time and then the rest of the poems, the, the, the rest of the poem, it breaks down and it has different panels and it goes much more into the blue. So maybe I'm going to post that in the next few days on my website because I had this idea of connecting the green of the forest and the blue of the water. So there's a whole transition when you look at the overall panel. So I hope I made a bit of a vision <laughs> of a, how the whole thing looks. And I'm going to read the poem now for you. Cut off an edge of time, release, let go, catch wind, descend, press down under the surface, sink in, listen, into the roots, churn dirt, thrust for water. Uh, that, um, you know, I, I read it, of course, <laughs> um, but this time it took a different level for me because of your vo the sound of your voice. So I was listening for that as well. And how each word has this world to that in it with which we were talking about. And I love the, the last two words that just sort of continue to resonate with me that will probably carry me for the rest of the day, maybe longer for sure. But to trust water, yeah, it's entirely beautiful and moving. 
and it makes me want to respond. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I just feel like, oh yes, I, you know, I want, I want to say, I want to show you, I trust you, and yeah. So I, I just want to let everyone know. I mean, we're, we're coming to the end um, of our interview with you, and what I what I want to do with this. Um, eternal forest is still unfolding within within tree sisters within the well of creativity and right now there's currently a creative journey happening um, with uh, 119 creative tree sisters and they're all kinds you know poets artists sculptures uh, musicians songstress um, and it doesn't really matter what the label is because we're all tuning into this creative possibilities and, and listening for what's next and what can we what can we do to be guided by the forest, by earth, by the water, by all the elements that we are part of. And what is it that we can, you know, like we talked about earlier, what can we bring in through that channel? through our work and so i'm going to be posting uh you know about your project in that group in that journey that i'm doing with these beautiful creative pe beings and i'm going to ask them to to tune in uh to this to this conversation to that poem to all of the journey that brought you to us and to yourself and to eternal forest and to ask them, you know, to express what is being awakened by this in them. As, as well as we've been tracking the different forests and in different parts of the world and to tune into that and to see how that can further develop. So I'm letting everybody know that right now that, and I'll put some more information. I'm going to be putting your website and all of that good stuff uh, for them to find out even more. And I, and I want to leave everybody by asking you, I mean, goodness, it's, it feels like a silly question right now because there's been so much that you've gifted in this call that if you could leave us with one, thing uh that would to open up our creativity what is the what is the suggestion um that you would have for everyone to, uh, so that everyone knows that they're creative like you know you and i we're always talking about and um the trust to trust that voice that wants to come through what would what would your your experience tell everyone yeah what i'm leaving with now and what is also here present very much very strongly is nature is it's not just at our doorstep it's everywhere and it's waiting it's really it's really um, invitation is there it's been issued and it's been issued very long time ago but i think now we really know uh, it's like we can't deny it it's been issued because of all the science that we've had recently as humanity and um and i think i feel this is a still very gentle way that we've had it so far of course we can't deny that there's a lot of suffering that has emerged but yeah. is still very gentle i feel and now is beautiful beautiful moment when we can receive really receive take this invitation say thank you and totally each of us can find such a beautiful, unique, gentle way, or maybe not so gentle, maybe it has to be yes. something super strong. It, I think it's very unique for everybody. Yeah. But to see what one, what you, what I, what each of us can do with this invitation. Yes. And it's for me, it's also both doing and being. Yes. So how can you be with this invitation? And mm -hmm. what can you do with this? Because now really is the time to 
to to be in a different way, but also to do in a different way. And both are equally equally important. Yes, yes, yes. I that is it. That's it right there. The invitation has been issued. Nature has um, issued the invitation and and um, is always waiting. And uh, nature is within and without us. It's in in woven so deeply into us that we just need to really realize and trust that is there, right? And to know, to follow it, and to trust. And then we're all together. Evgenia is here. I'm here. There's a bunch of beautiful tree sisters and other people all around just saying we're here to encourage each other, to sister each other, to um, support that. Uh, coming through and following the invitation and 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 uh, yeah accepting the invitation and I also just love what you just said about that it's the being and the doing and I connect that being in Tree Sisters with the in-breath and the out-breath and you know the what I've noticed because I feel so blessed to be part of Tree Sisters and to be working with the creatives as, as such as yourself, it's an absolute like in breath and out breath has come together for me. Whereas it's all so in perfect. Like it comes in, it nourishes me. This call has nourished me. Being able to share it with everyone has nourished me and the doing about bringing that out there and and you know accepting the invitation to listen to how how we can do this together i appreciate you so much sweetheart and i i cannot wait <laughs> um to join you <laughs> uh, you're amazing you're truly beautiful and amazing and i look forward to being part of the conversation with you soon either yes. when that comes and we'll share that with everybody too yeah all right, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much and look forward to more. <laughs> yeah.